Hi everybody, great to be with you. In this video, we're gonna talk about Julius Evola's principles of political theory. So what does he mean by the true state? What for him should a true state embody? Well, the first point is that it must be anti-democratic and anti-socialistic. Okay, Evola is against all forms of democracy and socialism. They represent the lowest common denominator. They're a kind of equality or egalitarianism built on what's low in man rather than on what's high in man. He has a hierarchical teaching where you have certain degrees of excellence. And so for all of these and related reasons, Evola's political theory is anti-democratic and anti-socialistic. Next point, he's against both capitalism and communism. Now, you might find that difficult to square. How can that be the case? And I think the idea here is that in both cases, he's against economism. He does not want economic thought to be the driver of social relations. And in capitalism, you end up with uh, production and consumption of material and spiritual values, as Leo Strauss once put it. And in communism, again, you have a certain sort of leveling that he's opposed to for other reasons. So... No democracy, no socialism, we saw that, but also no capitalism, no communism. Third point for Evola is that every true state needs a principle of authority and a transcendent symbol of sovereignty. And in the best case, this is represented by a monarch. So the monarchy is this symbol of transcendent sovereignty. And the monarch should have a certain sort of sacred chrism so that you see him as a kind of transcendental figure, okay? The monarchy is very important for Evola. Fourth point is that the monarchy is compatible with a legal dictatorship, which means that you can have a dictator, but the dictator doesn't take over the state. Like he doesn't abolish all offices and institutions. He doesn't abolish all laws and constitutions and suddenly make himself the absolute ruling power. He does make himself an absolute ruling power, but only when he's been given the dictatorial powers to deal with a certain sort of emergency. This is a topic that is developed in the works of Carl Schmitt. Evola is referring to it here. There is a certain sort of dictatorship that is compatible with monarchy. And for Evola, it's very important to make sure that your political theory includes that possibility, allows for it, and accepts it. Okay, fifth point. For Evola, the state is primary. What does that mean? That means the state precedes the nation, precedes the people, precedes society, as he puts it. The state and with the state, everything that is properly constituted as political order and political reality, quoting here, is defined essentially on the basis of an idea, not by naturalistic and contractual factors. So your natural racial, let's say, or natural ethnic or natural national identity does not constitute the important detail. Neither does the contractual element. As he puts it, not a social contract, but relations of loyalty and obedience, of free subordination and honor are the bases of the true state, which does not acknowledge demagoguery and populism. So the state comes first. It's the state-based theory. Others are race-based, others are nation-based, others focus on the people, but Evola's focuses on the state and the state defined on the basis of an idea. Sixth point, Evola is against totalitarianism. He supports decentralization. As he puts it, the state is organic and unified without being totalitarian. It allows for the possibility of a large margin of decentralization. Liberty and partial autonomy stand in relation to loyalty and responsibility according to a precise reciprocity. So there is freedom. The freedom is coupled with loyalty. And you don't have the smothering, suffocating totalitarian state, but you do have an organic and unified state with pockets of decentralization and partial autonomy. It should never be so decentralized and so autonomous that it loses its organic unity, but it shouldn't be so unified that it deprives everybody of liberty and autonomy. That would also be somehow wrong in Evola's political theory. Okay, the next point is that he's against parliamentary democracy. He's against party rule. He wants a corporatist state with high ideals. 
So you don't have parties, you don't have party politics, you don't have the yappers in parliament. And here, Evel is not alone. There are works like Carl Schmitt's Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy, which also suggests that in a parliament, all people do is talk, 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 and all decisive action is off the table. So that's not right for Evola. No parliamentary democracy, no party rule. The eighth point is that in Evola's political theory of the true state, the true state is against majority rule and it's against one man, one vote. It's not true that everybody simply by virtue of being a citizen should have a say and that everybody's say should be equal. In fact, as he puts it, the majority of a healthy and ordered nation should not be involved in politics. Okay, the ninth point concerns the political party. He says that on one hand, you need a political party for the period of transition. So in order to get to a true state, you're going to do that through the means of a political party. It's a necessary organ for a movement in a period of transition and struggle, but it should not be replaced by a single party once in power. We already saw that he's against party politics, but it should constitute something like an order. This is a new idea here, the order, which will participate in the dignity and authority concentrated in the center in the figure of the monarch, and assume some of the functions that in earlier traditional regimes belonged to the nobility as a political class in key positions of state. So somehow the party transforms into an order of nobility. Tenth point, anti-economism. I already said that in relation to communism and capitalism, but here he makes it explicit. Economics should not be the foundational science of politics. And you know, there are other thinkers. I'll give you a quick example. Alexander Dugan, when he writes about liberal democracy, he says the pillars of liberal democracy are economics and jurisprudence, because in jurisprudence, you have the field for the contestation of human rights. Whereas in Dugan's model, the primacy of economics and jurisprudence are replaced by ethnosociology, geopolitics, theology, and philosophy. So economics and jurisprudence are off to the side. They're matters of the 10th uh, degree of importance. Whereas theology becomes, as I say, so important, geopolitics becomes important, ethnosociology becomes important, and philosophy all the more. So, Ebola as well, anti-economism, it does kind of characterize right-wing anti-liberalism that they contest the debate between capitalists and communists, liberals and democrats, uh, the bourgeoisie and the socialists, in a way that says, look, you both put too much of an emphasis on the economy, and we don't. 11th point, Evola is against class division in the sense that he thinks the trade union movement should be abolished. So you can't have an organic unified state if you have a trade union movement that is always raising kind of um, class-based claims that introduce conflict and tension and dissension. So he's against trade unions and he does not want class warfare and he does not want a class spirit. Now, those of you who have a proletarian inclination or who are yourselves uh, sympathetic to Marxism, socialism, and trade unionism, obviously you're going to hear that and you're going to dislike it, but we're just trying to understand what Evola thinks and why he does. So no trade unions, no class warfare, no class spirit. It should be eliminated. Twelfth point. In Evola's science of the true state or in his principles of the true state or doctrine of the true state, you have, as he puts it, a principle of true justice, which entails denouncing what today is promoted as social justice. Social justice serves only the lowest classes of society, the so-called working classes, and works to the detriment of other classes, effectively leading to injustice. So social justice is sort of the name of the injustice that the lower class commits against the other classes. And Evola believes that there should be a defense of justice. Justice is an important virtue or principle in the teaching of the true state, but it can't be equated to, or it can't be reduced to, it shouldn't be identified with what we have come to know as social justice, since that is a kind of a spirit of class warfare driven by the left. Point 13, the true state will be hierarchical because it acknowledges and creates respect for the hierarchy of true values. You already saw that it's a state-based teaching where the state looks to the idea. That means that there are some ideas that are higher and some ideas that are lower. There's some values that are higher, some that are lower. There's a clear sense of rank, okay? Beauty is better than ugliness. Truth is better than falsity. Uh, excellence is better than degeneracy and all of these sorts of things. And so the true state will be hierarchical. It will put some things above and some things below. And this is typical of classical teachings. You find it in Plato and Aristotle, for example, the life 
lived in the pursuit of wisdom is higher than the life lived in pursuit of honor. The life lived in pursuit of, of honor is in some sense higher than the life that is just dedicated to mere satisfaction of physical pleasures and so on. So a rank order, a hierarchy, a uh, better and a worse, and therefore the true state will be hierarchical. Point 14 is roughly that there will be an atmosphere of the highest possible tension, but not of forced agitation. So it is not an unbent bow. The state and the society, the principles of the true teaching here, they should have kind of tension, readiness, um, alertness, okay, passionarity, a spiritedness to them. But it shouldn't be kind of like whipped up agitation. So how do you get those two things? You need the real vitality, but not it's sort of fake, um, the fake demagoguery that whips people up into a forced agitation. Okay, so it should be gen genuinely healthy, taut, okay, like ripe and ready to go. That is part of what, according to Evola, characterizes the atmosphere of life uh, in the context of the true state. And finally, interestingly, he says, there will not be an intrusion of what is public into the field of private life, but rather great freedom and great responsibility. So in the earlier section where he said that it's going to be an organic unified state, but not a totalitarian state, he's saying a similar thing. Okay, there will not be an intrusion of what is public into the field of private life, meaning you will have partial autonomy, little pockets of liberty, and some area where you can exercise both freedom and responsibility. In contrast, Evola believes there are states that have tried to destroy the realm of private life, its privacy, its dignity, its freedom, and its responsibility. In his view, that is just incorrect. That is the wrong thing to do. And any state that's totalitarian in that respect is not following the principles of the true state. Okay, interestingly enough, in Plato's Laws, the main character says that there should be a intrusion of what is public into the field of private life for a reason I want to give very quickly, which is that if you're a statesman or a legislator, you're concerned with the moral character and quality and habits of the people. And in many cases, those are formed in private. So you can't just leave everything private unattended to because it has political significance to the extent that it impacts the character of the people. And as a statesman or legislator, the character of the people becomes a matter of great importance because if they're fat, lazy cows, then you're going to get invaded by another country and it's going to destroy you. If they are, you know, self-seeking, a little greedy uh, bloodsuckers, then that's going to be something else altogether. If there's no spirit of camaraderie, of fraternity, of solidarity, if there's no sense of shared pleasures and pains, at least if there's no hardness to go into military battle for the sake of your country, then again, from the point of view of the statesman or legislator, you kind of have failed in your task of producing citizens who are adequate to the task of uh, citizenship, to its demands. All right, but for Evola, I mean, that's again at the level of the ideal principles, for example, in Plato's Laws. Okay, they don't actually have a, a police officer in every bedroom making sure that you are sleeping you know, on the right side of the bed, listening to the right music, copulating in the right way, although they probably would if they could. Uh, so for Evola, no intrusion of what is public into the field of private life, great freedom, great responsibility. So we've just gone through 15 points here that Evola presents in fascism viewed from the right concerning the principles of the true state. I hope you enjoyed that. I have a longer video on that book and other writings of Evola on the channel. Like, subscribe, share, comment, and see you in the next video.